calling to order this hearing or round table. This is a public round table being held by the committee, the whole of the Council of the District of Columbia. I'm Phil Mendelson, Chairman of the Council and Chair of the Committee of the Whole. Today is Friday, June 30th, 2023. The time is 1020 in the morning. Uh, I am in uh, room 500 the Council Chambers of the uh, John Wilson Building. Uh, the witnesses today, I believe, are all testifying or participating virtually via the Zoom video conference broadcast platform. Uh, this is a round table, which feels like a hearing, but the notice is slightly different. Uh, uh, to consider five legislative measures, all relating to nominations by the mayor for appointment or reappointment to the Commission on Arts and Humanities. The measures are PR 25-262, Commission on the Arts and Humanities, Cecily Habamana, Confirmation Resolution of 2023. PR 25-263, Commission on the Arts and Humanities, Chase Maggiano, Confirmation Resolution of 2023. PR 25-264, Commission on the Arts and Humanities, Carla Sims, Confirmation Resolution of 2023. PR 25-265, Commission on the Arts and Humanities, Julianne Rienza, Confirmation Resolution of 2023. And PR 25-266, Commission on the Arts and Humanities, Hector Torres, Confirmation Resolution of 2023. The uh, nominations of Carla Sims and Hector Torres are actually reappointments. For terms to end June 30th, 2026, the nominations of Ms. Habamana, Mr. Maggiano, and Ms. Brienza are uh, new appointments uh, for terms to end June 30th, 2025. The um, stated purpose of this hearing is to provide an opportunity to the public to comment if they wish, as well as for the committee to hear from the nominees. And the purpose or goal of the hearing is to uh, evaluate the fitness of the nominees for service on the commission. I have a sense that's not really an issue, but that's what hearings are about, is to give that opportunity for the public to comment. The Commission on the Arts and Humanities is an independent agency in the District of Columbia government that evaluates and initiates action on matters relating to the arts and humanities and encourages programs and the development of programs that promote progress in the arts and humanities. The Commission on Arts and Humanities is the designated state arts agency for the District of Columbia for purposes of federal arts support. The record in this matter will close at 5 p.m. on Monday, July 10th, 2023. That's not the full uh, two weeks we normally do provide. And also, as I noted, this is a round table, not a hearing, which is to say that the hearing notice was not, um, was not uh, filed uh, three, three weeks before today, with publication and register at least 15 days before today. However, uh, the intent is, barring any unforeseen problems, that the nominees will be, or the nominations will be presented to the council at its July 11th meeting for consideration. I want to note, because there was some concern expressed by the Commission on Arts and Humanities uh, a little over a month ago, the mayor initially sent nominations to the council on March 7th. However, uh, there was an error with regard to the term for one of the members, and it was the mayor's choice, that's the nature of our home rule government, which nominee would be corrected. And we did not get word of that until around June 7th, at which point the mayor uh, withdrew those nominations and submitted, resubmitted them with the correct term dates. Uh, so we're moving as quickly as we can, having had them for what, three weeks? 
Uh, and um, with that, I'm going to turn to the witnesses. I believe each witness has a statement. Uh, and after testifies, um, I'll have a few questions that I ask. I do want to thank in advance each of you for your willingness to serve. Those of you who have served, thank you for being willing to continue to serve. And those of you who are new, thank you for your willingness. And with that, let's uh, begin with Ms. Habamana. Hi, I uh, just want to take make sure everybody can hear me okay. You're a little faint. A little faint? Speak up. Yeah, that's better. Okay, perfect. Um, so my name is Cecily Habimana. I'm co-owner of So Creative Lounge. Um, before we get before I get started, I wanted to thank the committee for hosting this hearing and the mayor for my nomination. I moved to Washington, D.C. in 2000 to attend Howard University, where I received my BA in business management. I then earned my MBA with a concentration in nonprofit management from George Washington University in 2009. While at Howard University, I wrote my first grant to the DC Commission on the Arts and Humanities to support a dance company that I performed with back in college. During my career, I earned uh, and worked with a number of arts organizations throughout the DMV, including the Dance Institute of Washington, the Atlas Performing Arts Center, and the Clarice Smith Performing Arts Center. While at these organizations, I held various positions in development and managed relationships with institutional donors, including the DC Commission on the Arts and Humanities. Currently, I run my company, So Creative Lounge, located right outside of DC in Mount Rainier, Maryland. We are the culture keepers of sewing and quilting with the mission of teaching the world to sew one stitch at a time. I started this company after teaching pop-up sewing classes at the Anacostia Arts Center from 2014 to 2016. I have been featured in several publications and blogs, including the Washington Post, the Washington Express, American Express website, and the Chicago Tribune. I have also appeared on Fox 5 News, NPR, Wham U, just to name a few. I'm also recipient of the Six Figure Success Award and the Circle of Seven from Traffic Sales and Profit Mastermind. Through my experiences of, as a fundraiser for the arts, I grew to understand how important these funds are to artists and arts organizations throughout Washington, DC. Many of them would not be around if these funds were not available. I'm an artist, my mother is an artist. She taught in the public school system in Chicago for about 30 years. I grew up surrounded by art, but I have learned that the importance of art is not just about the art itself. It's about being creative in all aspects of life. Creativity is what we do on a day-to-day -day basis, but it's not just limited to dancing or acting or sewing or drawing, but it's also linked to things as simple as how you plant your flowers or adding a few extra spices to a recipe. Creativity allows us to view and solve problems more openly and with innovation. It opens our minds to possibility. The arts also builds confidence and helps us feel ready for life's experiences. I think my experience as an entrepreneur artist and fundraiser would be a continued perspective to the board. It's important for the commission to have someone who is an artist who has been a grantee both as an individual and a representative of, of an arts organization and also who understands the business of arts. My vision for the commission is to continue to stay relevant. The need for artists uh, has drastically changed in the past two years. We are just now getting out, out of the pandemic. A lot of the artists did not make it through this time. I would love to spearhead an initiative to re-engage artists and get them working and offering more services in Washington, DC. The DC Commission on the Arts and Humanities recognizes the importance of empowering artists and creative professionals to develop sustainable careers and businesses. As the community, as the community member of the commission, I would like to assist the DC Commission further foster artistic entrepreneurship by expanding outreach, offering additional resources and support, which can include, but are not limited to, workshops and seminars, mentorship programs, access to business resources, incubator spaces, and more. I hope that during my appointment that I can help the Commission to provide more comprehensive support for artistic entrepreneurship that can empower artists to build sustainable careers, contribute to the local economy, 
and strengthen the overall arts ecosystem in the District of Columbia. Thank you for this opportunity to testify and I welcome any questions that you may have. Uh, thank you, Ms. Habimana. Uh, next, we'll hear from Chase Maggiano. Thank you. Can everyone hear me okay? Yes, and good morning. Great. Good morning. My name is Chase Maggiano. I am grateful to the members of the committee for hearing my testimony and to the mayor for her continued support of the arts and my nomination to the DC Commission on the Arts and Humanities. And I'll just shorthand that to commission for the rest of my testimony. The last time I provided testimony to the council was in 2017 as part of a cohort of arts executives and artists advocating for increased funding for the DC Commission. Like so much of my time as an arts executive, artist, and arts supporter in Washington, I was glad to be just a small part of helping more art happen through that effort. I grew up in Northern Virginia and went to college at George Washington University, where I studied English and music. I remained here in DC after school, and I've had the privilege of working in various roles in Washington within arts management as a professional violinist and now in the musical instrument industry. My day job is not all that common in Washington. I am an expert luthier specializing in the repair and restoration of fine bows of the violin family. With this niche skill set focused on antique violin bows, which are both collectible and tools used by musicians, I bring the identity of a maker and creator to the DC Commission. My job allows me to serve professionals playing at the highest level, as well as students here locally in programs such as the DC Youth Orchestra Program. The fun fact, the Washington DC region is actually home to more unionized musicians than New York City. And I've been honored to play violin alongside them and get to know the varied musicians in our region. The vibrance of our arts community is something that I actually get to see every day in my profession, although I, I usually see it from a slightly different angle as someone helping musicians with their tools. My experience in the DC arts community, however, runs deeper than my profession as a luthier. I have been fortunate to engage with the Commission on the Arts and Humanities previously as executive director of two different nonprofit choral organizations, the Gay Men's Chorus of Washington and the Washington Chorus. In applying for and receiving grants, I know firsthand how impactful the commission can be to sustain and grow the homegrown talents of DC's artists and institutions. I have also had the opportunity to serve as grant panelist, which gave me insight into the dedicated team working to make more art happen here in our city. Uh, personally, I'm a believer that the arts can paint a picture of the world as we want it to be, and then it's kind of up to everyone else to make that world a reality. Without the vision and inspiration of artists, our path toward a more harmonious and equitable society is blurred. I have spent the better part of my professional life and almost all of my personal life in the arts in and around Washington, D.C. First, as an intern at Washington Performing Arts nearly 15 years ago, I saw how arts education creates more empathic, curious, and well-rounded children. Working under the leadership of Jenny Billfield, I learned the value and need for inclusive and accessible arts, particularly across the river, where I was proud to produce Washington Performing Arts' first fall arts festival at the Ark. My experience in creating more access carries with me today in my role as board chair of the Virginia-based arts education nonprofit, Sound Impact. As a former executive director of two large choruses here in Washington, I have seen adults find community they never had before through the arts. In organizing concert tours with the State Department in Ukraine and Cuba, I have witnessed the direct effect that arts and culture can have on human rights advancements. And I am sure all of us here have experienced that the arts and humanities can simply make our lives more pleasing and enjoyable. And sometimes I think art for art's sake can be enough to make our city a more vibrant place to live and to visit. I believe that our city can reflect all of these things and I'm excited to be a small part of this mission. My passion for the arts community in Washington is perhaps best exemplified by the decades I have spent creating and supporting the creation of arts in this city. Of the hundreds of ensembles I have performed with or managed, one experience that inspires me most was overseeing the creation of the city's first LGBTQ youth chorus, the Gen Out Chorus, under the banner of the Gay Men's Chorus of Washington. I am honored to have been a part of creating a community and a voice through music for vulnerable youth eight years ago, 
and that ensemble is still alive and strong today, now giving their own full concerts throughout the district. I desire to serve the commission because I feel that it is my time to give back to a city that has given me so much. In being mentored by artistic leaders and peers in the city, I have come to know the values of equity, of high level artistry, and of community connectivity through the arts. Having led two different arts organizations, I know how art happens and I understand the constraints and opportunities of local artists and community organizations. I am certainly knowledgeable about organizational finances, mission alignment, staffing constraints, and the community needs of our city. I hope to bring this experience to the DC Commission in supporting the broad landscape of arts organizations and artists in the city. We are a rich history in Washington, and we have a strong fabric, a strong fabric of artists who serve as the heartbeat of Washington. And it is this richness that I think deserves continued, continued support. I hope that we can find ways to create and promote more arts events that attract visitors from neighboring regions. As a proud DC resident, I love that visitors come here to use their voice in protest and to look back at history of the founding of our nation. But I also love this idea that we can have a vibrant living conversation of art and culture today, which encourages visitors and local artists alike to connect and reflect. As the world around us is changing, the commission is also in a period of strategic and cultural change. I hope to meet the moment by being a voice on the committee who bridges the best of our recent past while looking toward the future with a keen sense of what's possible. Anyone who knows me knows that I thrive in the dream space, but I also create in the space of reality. I believe a board should be allowed to dream, especially an arts board, and I'm confident that my experience and temperament can be harnessed for organizational thoughtfulness and reliable board governance to help the commission encourage maximum participation in the arts and humanities throughout our city. Please thank you for allowing me to testify and I welcome any questions later on. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mantiano. Uh, next we'll hear from Carla Sims and good morning. Uh, I think you're muted. All right, sorry about that. Good afternoon, Chairman Mendelson, council members, and staff of the Committee of the Whole. I am deeply honored and humbled by the nomination for reappointment by Mayor Muriel Bowser to serve as a second term as commissioner on the DC Commission on the Arts and Humanities, and I appreciate the opportunity to testify before you today. As a commissioner, I have actively served on the Public Arts Committee, on the Finance Committee, and I've been a reviewer on several grant panels. I present myself to you not as an individual, but as a representative of a collective that is passionate, dedicated, and committed to the art and the humanities in this city. My nomination for appointment is a testament to the hard work and achievements of everybody involved on the commission. And I'd be remiss if I didn't acknowledge the exceptional leadership of Commission Chairman Reggie Van Lee, our recently appointed director, uh, executive director, Aaron Myers, Deputy Director David Markey, and all the other commissioners and staff who serve at the commission. As an ardent admirer and enthusiast, enthusiast of art and culture, my journey has been marked by consistent engagement with the arts, both in my personal life and in my professional career. I'm a creative. Uh, I'm, I'm married to creative. I work for creatives. And when I want to be enriched, I enjoy the art of creatives. As I mentioned, I'm married to creative, and it's largely due to my husband, jazz harmonicist Frederick Yane, that I even got firsthand experience with the commission. And it was back, I think, in like 2006 or so when the commission was under the leadership of, of uh, Tony Gittins. Anyway, Fran uh, Frederick was a grant recipient, and he often engaged me to help him with his application, uh, to which I have to say was is 100%, 100% better since that time. As the wife of an artist, I am sensitive to the needs and challenges of emerging artists, and I'm committed to creating developmental opportunities to help them achieve their goals. In addition to being married to an artist, I'm a business owner. Uh, I have my own public relations firm, and my work is centered on promoting the work and arts and brands of artists. My clients include DC's own Dave Chappelle, singer-writer Erica Badu, and supermodel Naomi Campbell. 
Just as I'm sensitive to the challenges of emerging artists, I'm also very aware of the power and influence of some of the more famous and iconic artists. Part of my work and is to make sure that all of the artists that I work with create opportunities to lift up other artists, whether it's through funding or creating and providing elevated platforms. And of course, when I want to be enriched, I enjoy the work of artists, whether it's at the Atlas Theater around the corner in my neighborhood or at the Kennedy Center. Oftentimes, uh, I get to witness the work of grantees, and it's always a learning and ex uh, a learning opportunity. Um, I'm an advocate for artistic freedom and expression, and I've been involved in numerous events, productions, public arts initiatives that have put the local and national spotlight on Washington, D.C., including the creation of the mayor's uh, Black Lives Matter Plaza and the 51st State Mural Initiative. I also produced and consulted on three Netflix specials filmed here in D.C. and received three Grammy Awards. I have contributed with grassroots arts, I'm sorry, I've contributed to grassroots arts organizations, produced cultural events, and advanced for policies promoting arts and education. That is the experience and insight that I bring to the commission. When I first took this role back in 2020, I promised to dedicate myself wholeheartedly to nurturing our vibrant cultural uh, ecosystem, enriching our community through the transformative power of art, and striving to ensure that art remains accessible, diverse and significant. Looking back at our journey, I am proud to say that together we have turned these communities into tangible realities. In the past three years, the commission has made notable strides in various areas. We've expanded our outreach, engaged with communities that have been previously underserved, uh, and, and I'm sorry, and previously underserved. From Anacostia to Georgetown, from Capitol Hill to Columbia Heights, we have celebrated the rich diversity of our district and amplified voices that needed to be heard. Our emphasis on inclusion not, is not, has not only led to a richer cultural environment, but also fosters understanding and uni unity among our various communities. Moreover, in the face of the global challenges that mark the years 2020, 2020 to 2022, our commission remained steadfast, steadfast, resilient, and creative. We leverage the power of, of the arts to provide comfort, encouragement, encourage dialogue, and foster resilience during what continues to be a pretty tough time for many. The implementation of virtual exhibitions and digital art education programs ensured that our commitment to accessible art remained unwaver unwavered despite the physical barriers. I am especially proud of our successful innovations to support local artists that were heavily impacted by these global events. The emergency grant program we implemented that supported hundreds of artists and cultural organizations provided much needed assistance in a time of crisis. This uh, critical relief effort underlined the value we place on our artists and their significant contributions to the fabric of our society. After all, the arts aren't a luxury. They're a necessity and a catalyst for growth, change, and a better understanding of the world around us. I'm deeply grateful for this opportunity and I trust and trust that you have placed in me. It's an honor to serve our city, our artists and our communities. If reappointed, I promise to continue advocating for the arts, empowering our artists and inspiring our community in the same with the same passion and commitment that has defined my term so far. Thank you so much for considering my reappointment. Together let us stay continue uh, to continue to shape our city into a vibrant and inclusive cultural hub. I'm happy to answer any questions that you have. Thank you, Ms. Sims. Uh, Julianne Brienza, and good morning. Good morning, Committee of the Whole, Chairman Mendelssohn, and my fellow nominees. I am Julianne Brienza. I was born and raised in Dillon, a small Montana town, two hours north from the Gardner Gate to Yellowstone. My passion for theater and the community that surrounds it started young with the Missoula Children's Theater and the Montana Vaudeville Players. I graduated from Viterbo, a Catholic Franciscan liberal arts university in Wisconsin with a theater degree and minors in philosophy and visual art. 
In 2000, my professional journey brought me to the East Coast, where I served as an apprentice at the Arden Theater Company in Philadelphia. Settling in Washington, D.C. in 2003, I have embraced D.C. as my home. In 2005, I began serving as the founding director of Capital Fringe, a small nonprofit theater organization. Over the course of Fringe's nearly two decades, I have raised and managed a budget that has fluctuated between 300,000 to 1.9 million. During my time in DC, my unwavering focus has revolved around establishing and nurturing Fringe empowering small theater companies and independent artists and fostering our community's curiosity for live theater, music, and visual art. Growing and sustaining a small to medium-sized art, arts nonprofit has been a perpetual challenge. However, my dedication to creating accessible systems for artists and audience engagement extends beyond the confines of Fringe, encompassing the broader growth and sustainability of the thriving DC arts ecosystem. Throughout my journey as the female founder and leader of an arts nonprofit, I have fostered numerous collaborations with businesses, community groups, and individuals. These partnerships have been key collective efforts to promote the arts at a citywide level. I have traversed performance tents in parking lots and primarily using vacant properties as performance spaces and the permitting and licensing that all of that entails. I have served on numerous CHA grant panels and provided assistance to artists and small organizations in developing their grant proposals. I learned very early on in DC the role of community advocacy. I have actively served on, served on and led arts advocacy committees working to secure increased funding and promote equity within the arts community. In founding Fringe, we initially partnered with CHA, which is the commission, it's just the, acron uh, the abbreviation, which paved the way for Fringe to become a grantee in our second year. Over the course of Fringe's 18 year history, we have been very fortunate to receive about 30 grants for general operating support programs and capital investments. This funding under the leadership of 10 executive directors at the commission has, has been vital components in driving the sustainability of our organization. I believe the commission's role is to administer grant programs for individual artists, arts organizations, and community organizations. Beyond grants, their role encompasses providing training and technical assistance to foster artists and organizational development, conducting impactful research on the arts and preserving and promoting the rich cultural heritage of DC. In 2018, the commission was afforded the significant step forward by the establishment of stable funding by the allocation of 5% of sales tax, re tax revenue to the Arts and Humanities Fund. This funding supports the agency's general operations and grant programs for individual artists and organizations. Ensuring the reliable timing of grant proposals and subsequent funding is vital to fulfilling the commission's mission effectively. I am eager to contribute actively to fostering relationships beyond the government and engaging with other branches of the DC government. Together, we can address pressing needs such as the continued rising cost of living and the loss of arts and humanities practitioners to jurisdictions outside of DC. By forging strong alliances, the agency's goals can be propelled forward and we continue to sustain and grow the vibrant arts and humanities communities of our city, of our nation's capital during this unprecedented time of continual changes and adaptations around the globe. In conclusion, it is an honor to be nominated as a mayoral nominee to the board of the DC Commission on the Arts and Humanities. It is a commission that I believe through its funding has provided many district residents with joy and curiosity in small and big ways. I am energized to be nominated to ensure the commission's continued success 
and sustainability for all district residents. I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you, Ms. Prienza. Uh, and then we will hear from Hector Torres and then I'll have a few questions. Mr. Torres, good, good morning. Good morning, Chairman Mendes and members of the council. Again, good morning. My name is Hector J. Torres. I'm an artist, a 43 year resident of the District of Columbia, a senior Latino, Puerto Rican, gay and married here in the District of Columbia to my husband and partner of 54 years, Jay Haddock. Prior to my retirement in 2018, I was a hotel executive of Capital Hotels, a DC-based hotel company with over 300 employees. I love our city, have chosen to live here and consider myself almost a native. I also believe and support our desire for statehood. I have proudly served in the DC Arts and Humanities Commission for one term and humbled and thankful to the Mayor Bowser for her trust in my reappointment, more importantly, for the council's past support and approval of my prior appointment and hopefully my reappointment. I have for years believed and practiced with passion that one must contribute to the community to enrich it, that one can evoke and make a difference uh, for change. As such, I have served on numerous boards, helped to raise funds for organizations that are the core of their mission is to serve the underserved. I have personally found the experience as commissioner as challenging and gratifying at multiple levels and have been proactive in various committees, particularly grants committee, education Com executive committee, and education committee that oversee the funding and programs that offer are driven by established principles of DEIB under the distinguished chairmanship of Reggie Van Lee and recently appointed executive director, Aaron Myers. We, our city is the National Center for the Arts, and as such, I applaud that we have one of the nation's greatest per capita funded arts organizations in the Commission of the Arts and Humanities, as it recognizes the value of artistic community, its contribution, and its vital economic impact. I am personally gratified to see how the Commission has further evolved in the support of com to communities of color with intentionality and in doing so, setting an example for equity and inclusion, a mission that is constantly evolving while also supporting our world-class arts institutions and encouraging them to practice the EIB principles that will support and impact the entire community of the district and the nation. Through its example, uh, in recent years, we have significantly grown our reach and supported nascent arts practitioners and artistic endeavors that without our support would have not been able to have their voices heard, seen, or appreciated. As a practicing artist, I understand the plight of art practitioners. I feel that I can contribute to the dialogue that is needed in order to accomplish the highest possible degree of equity in our funding and access to all communities, and in turn, cast the widest net to encourage and include art education access to our young, working and retiring community so as to enrich their lives. Art expands the mind by opening it to extend expansive opportunity. It supports our dreams, adds fuel to our creativity, and in all aspects, our lives and our endeavors. I want to encourage the city to continue providing support and funding to our arts community and community in general with a broader vision and provide the impetus for growth and opportunity and the benefit of the economic engine it has proven to be. I firmly believe that in supporting artists in all their manifestations, our city, will and should support their retention and residents so that they can create, contribute, thrive with and within our diverse community. Thank you for the honor and opportunity to serve. I look forward to renewing my efforts on behalf of our city and our community. In addition, thank you Chairman Mendelson for your support in allowing me to be for you and the, the council. I'm happy to address any questions you may have. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Torres. I have a few questions that uh, I ask for at all nomination hearings, and I'm going to ask those and a couple of other questions. Uh, again, I want to thank each of you for your testimony. Uh, I'm going to begin with this. Um, Ms. Sims, Mr. Torres, you both have served on the commission. 
How much time does it take, Ms. Sims? I mean, if I have to be completely candid, it, it can be a part-time job. It, it takes a lot of time. Uh, you have, I mean, specifically or, or like? How many hours a week maybe, or does it meet every week? Some the commit you can you could actually have a commitment at least once a week. Uh, you have the board the the full board meeting. If you have committee meetings, uh, you know that could be once a week, depending on how many committees you are on. And then there's you know actually doing the work that is being requested as part of that uh, committee. So it. it um. Was there anything more you wanted to say on that? You were getting a little faint, so it was hard to hear. Well, I know that, uh, um, yeah, it, it's a lot. We have a small, it's a, it, uh, we have a small group of people that we're uh, dividing all of these committees between. So, and oftentimes you find yourself on three or four committees. It could be easily on, you know, two or three. If not, but four. some of that is volunteering to be on those different committees. Of so course, you could volunteer course. to be on four or three or two. Right. But the work needs to get done. So, and, and mm -hmm. all of us are committed. So a lot of times uh, you have commissioners that are very engaged. You speak a little louder. I'm, I'm sorry. So the, I'm saying that the work needs to get done. So you have various commissioners that are involved on multiple committees. So it can be very time consuming. Uh, Mr. Torres, how much time do you spend? Well, putting a number of hours, it's approximately about three to four hours a week. However, depending on the panel oversight, so during, uh, the, during the season when the panels are reviewing, if you volunteer, it could actually take an entire day, literally from nine to five or a full half day. Um, so it depends on the time of the year and the engagement that you have and, and the issues that you're discussing uh, within your committees and or basically the, the overall. I'm also on the executive committee, so we meet before we actually formally meet. So there is a uh, need for uh, sometimes an inordinate amount of time. Now, do I find it absolutely necessary? Yes, absolutely, in order to get the work done. You must be present. Um, I think it's a vital and uh, vital uh, component of our commitment, and uh, I, I welcome it. You know, and sometimes it's a lot more than what I anticipated originally. But here I am, going for a renomination and accepting it, and delighted to do so because I believe that the work that we do is vital to our city, and I'm thankful to be able to do that. Uh, thank you. So that was actually a setup question. So, Ms. Sims. Do you have the time to participate fully when reappointed? Yes, I have always taken the time and made the time to do the work of the commission. Mr. Torres, same question for you. Do you have the time? I do, or I'll make it. Uh, Ms. Habimana, do you have the time? Yes, I do. Uh, Mr. Maggiano, do you have the time? I do. And Ms. Brienza, do you have the time? I'm going to echo Hector. I'm going to make the time. Okay. The second question, thank you, each of you. The second question I have, I know this was in the pre-hearing questions I sent each of you, and thank you for your answers, uh, but I always ask this at hearings. Are you current in all your district tax, district and federal taxes and obligations, at least to the best of your knowledge? Uh, who I'm going to start with Mr. Maggiano. To the best of my knowledge, I am, yes. Ms. Brienza? Yes. Ms. Sims? Yes. Mr. Torres? Yes. I did not hear that. Can you say that again? <laughs> I said absolutely and yes. <laughs> okay, and Ms. Habimana? Yes, I am. Uh, the third question that I always ask is about conflicts of interest. And if there is the possibility, how you would handle that. So maybe I'll go in reverse order. Um, Ms. Habimana, do you know of any conflict, possible conflicts of interest? And if there are any, what would you do? 
Uh, no, I don't have any conflicts of interest at this time. But if I, if it was that um, there was an opportunity where I, there was a, a conflict, I would just recuse myself from um, that meeting or, um, um, and then also just uh, talk to anybody that will be available to help um, if, if I wasn't sure what to do in that particular instance. Thank you, Mr. Torres. Um, I have no conflict of interest uh, and have never had. The, the, the one thing also, there are very few opportunities uh, in the functioning of these committees where grants are made where there is a conflict of interest because you really are not a deciding factor. You are a supportive factor. The work is done by a, a group of individuals that are volunteers as well that are reviewers, panelists that do the hard work of reviewing the committee. Our only function in these committees is to oversee that they are following the principles of DEIB. And to that extent, we, I think that we all are committed to that. Thank you. Ms. Sims, uh, do you, have you had any conflicts of interest or do you know of any possibility? <laughs> or if there were, what would you do? I don't have any conflicts of interest. And if I were to have a conflict of interest, I would recuse myself from that particular vote if it was related to a vote. Uh, otherwise, I would echo what Hector said. Ms. Brianza. Capital Fringe is a grantee of the commission, so for the GOS grant, um, but I don't believe that is a conflict of interest due to the way that the grant panels and the process work. But if it were to become an issue, I would recruit myself from voting on that grant. Um, that specific grant in the board meeting and ask for advice from my fellow uh, commissioners and reach out to those who can help with that matter. Thank you, Mr. Maggiano. Uh, thank you. Similar to Julianne, I was uh, recently in leadership and on board on the board of two organizations that receive regular funding from the commission. Uh, I don't think it is a conflict, however, to avoid any appearance. Um, I would be happy to recuse myself to recuse myself from discussions around those two organizations, but I would probably just also ask Bega uh, for some guidance to ensure that I'm being legal and ethical. Thank you. Um, Ms. Sims, in reading the answers to the pre-hearing questions, there was one question that um, I would like you to resubmit the answer. You could do it by email. Uh, I had, it was question 12. It was about local political activity. Um, and your answer was no conflicts of interest, which is not the same as um, please describe any local political activity. So if you, you can do it by email, but if you would just uh, resubmit that. No problem. Um, Several of you in your testimony um, commented on the need for equity or diversity uh, in the arts. And uh, so I want to ask, just put this question out to each of you. Uh, what do you think we can do to achieve more diversity and equity in the arts? Why don't we start with Ms. Sims? And if you could speak up a little louder, you were getting pretty faint there before. The moment you're muted. Thank you. So uh, there is the equity and inclusion task force and that task force has laid out some guidelines for what we need to be doing uh, to achieve a certain le a level of equity and inclusion. And the commission has been actively uh, uh, implementing as many of those um, recommendations as possible. So I think if we continue along that path, we, we'll be uh, we'll be fine in terms of of the effort being made. Uh, Mr. Torres, I, I I certainly believe that there have been enormous strides in the issue of inclusion and diversity, and I applaud that. However, there is one particular aspect that I believe that. We need to follow uh, in, in, in this agency, as well as all governmental agencies, the established law that provides for Language Access Act. I think that this is one area that I've brought forward 
and that there is at least a a known effort to to create this but i need mean, it has to be it has to be implemented in order for us to truly serve on an equitable basis to all communities and it's just simply to follow the law thank you uh, thank you mr maggiano Uh, thank you. Uh, first of all, I don't think in inequity is limited to the arts. Um, it's, it's unfortunately everywhere. Uh, I echo that we should follow the guidance of the task force. Um, I think that is, that is a, a really strong path. I also think we can look to other granting communities um, in other industries in the ways that they are implementing equitable grant making. Um, there's a lot of new stuff happening uh, and understanding uh, the, the, the structures that set up sort of what we all see as uh, typical grant making and um, and why those those sometimes are great and sometimes are not so great um, is is a great step to implementing what what we all can agree on are the right steps going forward. Uh, thank you, uh, Miss Miss Havimana. Yes, I think that it's um, you know equity and inclusion is something that's going to be an ongoing process um, that requires continuous effort and commitment by all stakeholders. Um, I definitely think that, um, you know, following the advice of the task force um, will be something that we should continue to do, but we have to have this is a two way effort. I don't think there's one solution to any of it. I think it's about education. I think it's about um, um, just learning about different communities, because sometimes we may not even identify that we're excluding somebody or a group of people if we're not aware of that particular situation. Uh, thank you, Ms. Brienza. I, I think that the process towards equity does not live in a written document and it does um, continue, we have to all have, have to continue having conversations, which I look forward to those with the, with the fellow commissioners. I also think we're in a city that has a lot of gatekeeping and a lot of hierarchical, hierarchical structures um, that do afford us uh, and afford a lot of younger and um, not so established folks coming to the city to have good paying jobs. But I think we need to examine how all of that flushes out outside of written documents that we rely on. Thank you, give me just a second. Uh, thank you for that. I don't have any other questions for you. If by chance there's anything you want to supplement, uh, please feel free to send it to us. Um, as I indicated at the beginning, the record in this matter will be open until 5 p.m. Monday, July 10th. And my plan is to put your nominations before the council on July 11th. Uh, that's why it's July 10th is the record closing. Uh, so feel free if you want to supplement and anybody who's watching or maybe watching or anybody that you who are here are talking to, the record's open for anybody who wants to submit comments until 5 p.m. on the 10th. Again, to the two of you who've served, thank you. To all of you, thank you for your willingness to serve. Um, the commission is important. And uh, as some of you noted uh, with the, the um, dedicated funding. There is a substantial revenue stream to the commission, to the arts, to promote the arts. So uh, thank you for the uh, work. And with that, this hearing is going to be adjourned. The time is 11.08 a.m. and this hearing is adjourned. <laughs>